kingdom polemics exist to equip the church for battle against the kingdom of darkness in light of the particular threats of our day. Kingdom polemics is about taking the cosmic Christological concepts of the Scottish Reformed and connecting it to the ground. How are you doing? How are you all? Good to be making some content again. You know, it's funny because the other day, uh, actually not earlier this week, I recorded a couple episodes. One came out today and there's another one in the pipeline. And I was just having like a moment where I was like, man, what am I going to talk about next? I don't know. I had like this writer's writer's block when it comes to podcasting. And um, a, a week a week ago or so, this 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 uh, video was being you know streamed around and bounced around about uh, the local flood by Gavin Ortland. And uh, I'm not that familiar with Gavin Ortland uh, particularly, but I am familiar with the Ortland family. And, you know, you have Dane and uh, the, the father, I believe his name is Ray Orland, and Emmanuel Nashville Church. So I am familiar with that sphere in general, but not so much uh, Gavin in particular. And uh, at first I was like, come on, man, who really cares about this whole local flood uh, mumbo jumbo? You know, it's just sometimes as a as someone who like interacts and speaks uh, the way I do here, you you don't you don't talk about everything. But I kept seeing it come up. I kept seeing it bounce around on Twitter, and so I listened to both episodes. I'm gonna stream them. I'm gonna add them to the show notes here, so you can hear both episodes if you haven't heard them. One is a, a case for a local flood. And the other is uh, a response to the responses. And after listening to them and he, and seeing people talk about it for a while, I was like, I, I think that uh, this would be worth some time to interact with. Not so much because of the specifics of a local flood per se, but I think that this topic being addressed in this way by these kind of Christians is more indicative of a systemic issue. This, this interacting with the text and this way and this interpretation of the Bible and this manner, it's more of a a trend in so many uh, Christian conversations. And I believe it's a, it's an issue in the PCA. So, you know, I, I think that addressing this issue would be important not just for the clarity about the the flood but just this conversation in christianity uh that is similar to this in this way i mean it pretty much comes down to this there's us there's this pattern now of novelty novelty in interpreting essential scriptures and systematic con- con- concepts and ethics uh, and Some kind of, well, it's novel, but yeah, I can find some guy here and some kind there kind of like agreeing with me. Like I'm just hearing this novel understanding of something Christian, this third way or either way of something Christian uh, that is just repetitive. It's repetitive. Um, and and by the way, uh, you know Gavin, he's doing this kind of conversation, uh, and many different conversations. You know, he's in other places in the creation conversation about this. So here's what I want to do: I want to unpack. Can we actually, as Christians, give credibility of any kind to some textual reasoning for a local flood? Is a local flood a legitimate? view is a local flood uh, i think one of the things that, that he says many times that a local flood is, is a, lo- a, lo- a local view of the flood is not indicative that you are um departing from orthodoxy and uh, some essential doctrine is that the case so let, let's just jump right in to why i believe that 
there is absolutely zero conversation about the flood of Noah being local. And I'm going to spend all of my time making an exegetical case for that. So number one reason why uh, the Portland fantasy, I believe, is a farce, that'll be the title, um, is that there's a connection between the creation dominion mandate and the Noahic narrative. So Genesis 126 says, God said, let make let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and give uh, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth so that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So that is clearly a universal, global, comprehensive statement about creation. Okay. And 129 says, and God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, which is in the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat. And every beast of the earth, and every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth on the earth, wherein there is life, I have given thee every green herb for meat, and it was so. So that is clearly, clearly a universal, not local statement. Now, obviously, this is local, but these are local statements being made about the whole creation. And I want you to notice how Moses, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking about the Noahic narrative and events with this creational, cosmic, global truth and similarity. Genesis 9, 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the seas. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. And every green herb I have given you all things. So the, the language about being the animals being given these these at these uh these plants, right? Including Adam. So that language of the creation in a whole being given this, that ain't that that language of man uh having this global dominion to uh and these principles of being an image bearer in the whole earth, the same conversation, the same global. Whole world imperatible uh, call of creation is being restated and repackaged uh, in the Noah story, meaning that the global creational conversation is the same global creational conversation in the story of Noah. This Noah is not speaking about the blessedness of God to subdue and rule and be fruitful and multiply only for a small locality, any more than that is being said in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And by the way, I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about creation with this universality in oughtness as it comes to his image bearer. So the creation dominion mandate is universal in its local place that it's expressed. And therefore, the Noahic Covenant, the Noahic events, the Noahic story is very much echoing that universality and comprehensiveness of creation. Secondly, uh, the reason why this could not be a local flood is because there is a general symmetry of the whole creation conversation about the whole creation in Genesis 1 to 2 and Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. And by the way, and or- Orlin uh, says many times, well, we have to be sensitive to what the people of this time would have been listening and hearing and how they would understand these words. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And they would have been hearing everything in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9 with Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. They would be seeing the language in the Noah story in the chapters right before that, that they just heard. So Genesis 2, 6 says, but there was a mist. They went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. 
And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Hear those words and then go to Genesis 6, 13. And behold, I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. There is a symmetry with God's statements for his whole creation that he makes in the first few chapters. And the destruction that is occurring and also the recreation that happens after these events. Genesis 1.29 says, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree. Okay? Genesis, and then Genesis 7.3 in the Noah account says, Of the fowls also the air by sevens, a male and female, to keep alive, keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Genesis 121 is talking about seed upon the face of the earth for all living creatures. Genesis 7 3 is saying this seed is to keep alive, keep alive seed upon the face of all the earth for the creatures. Genesis 128 says, uh, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So think about this. They're reading chapter one, and it says, I give you dominion over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And then 619 says, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall be brought into the ark. The comprehensive every and all language of creation, which applies to all creation, is has a symmetry that is very parallel, very parallel to uh, the previous few chapters. And then it says, and Genesis 1, 2, listen to this. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Genesis 7, 11. Going to the Noah story, going to creation of Noah. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. This Face of deep in creation, okay, that is then filled with land, and there's a separation of the waters. The great deep from creation is broken up, right, in this destruction event. So, if the face of the deep is speaking about the globe comprehensively, then the fountains of the great deep, speaking of the same reality, same substance. Um, is also that global deep that is breaking up and destroying the globe. So there's a there's a symmetry of creation language with the Noah event. The global realities of creation are being restated in the global destructive realities of the Noah event. Another important connection is the pneumatological symmetry and connectionness uh, connectedness of the creation event and also the Noah uh, events and the flood events. So Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the uh, Ruach was God, the Ruach of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Go to Genesis 6 3. And the Lord said, My spirit, my Ruach, shall not always strive with man. For he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. So the Ruach, which is re, it is applying the word of Yahweh to bring to fruition the word of Yahweh on the ground. It is over, it's superintending and hovering over the face of the deep. This Ruach is going to bring a judgment to the world that he shaped in the creation. There's a connection between the spirit hovering over the faces of the deep in creation and the striving and judgment of the Ruach in the Noah event. And here's something interesting uh, in, in 8.1. And God remembered Noah and every living thing, Genesis 8.1, and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind. The word is Ruach. 
God made a ruach to pass over the earth and the waters assuage. Now, whether you could understand that as the Holy Spirit uh, in particular or not, it still is making a connection between the original waters, right, that were being hovered over by the ruach. And then in Genesis 6, 3, the same spirit that created everything is said, is said to bring judgment and strive against the, the wickedness of man. And then we see this ruach, this great wind that is going over the globe in judgment and in also the removal of uh, the removal of the water and, and bringing land back. Okay. And what's interesting about the, the Ruach that is passing over the waters, is it, it is in the Hithpael. And the Hithpael has many uses, but one is the iterative use, which speaks about repeated action. It's the same word used in, in, in Genesis 6, uh, the, the same, the same um, verb form in Genesis 6, which says, Noah walked with God. What does it mean that Noah walked with God? It means that he was constantly living his life in the trajectory of faith in God. So this water was repeatedly, progressively moving back and forth as they receded. This is this 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 whole imagery is bringing us back to creation. What's fascinating about the Noah event textually is that you see that the Holy Spirit is superintending his creative will over the waters and then all of a sudden land comes out and this comes out and and it becomes formed and filled starting with his hovering over the waters. And then in the Noah event, that, that, that world that the Holy Spirit formed and filled is decreated. All of the things that came out of the water are then covered by the water and destroyed by the water. And then God remembers and going back and forth, this Ruach is then bringing the mountains back up out of the water, bringing land back up. This is a recapitulated, recapitulating event of the Ruach of God, clearly showing the globality, that's, that's not even a word, the globality of, of the events. There is a textual reason for this global understanding. And by the way, this moving back and forth of the wind over the waters is a textual reason for why the earth geographically is different the ruach of god going over the globe and the waters as the water's coming down is this iterative repetitive action of reshaping the earth as it comes back out of the water another reason why uh there could be no local flood i believe uh is the repetitiveness of seven uh, in the narrative of genesis Genesis 8, 4, it says the ark rested in the seventh month. Genesis 7, 10, it said it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. There is a stream of sevens that is repetitive. And everyone knows uh, that seven in the Bible speaks about completeness, totality, right? So this seven uh, that is going on in the destruction events of the ark and, and, and the flood it is surrounded by these, these numbers which speak of completeness. This is a complete destruction, an undoing of the creation. With all the seven imagery and, and, and theme throughout uh, these chapters. It is a complete destruction of the earth that God made in seven days. God made the earth in six days. He rested on the seventh day. And this seven speaks about completeness of the whole creation week. And in the Noah event, the number seven is telling us that this world is being completely destroyed. Completely and not partially. Another reason why I believe that this is universal is that the depravity, the language of depravity in the text is universal. And since the language of the text is universal and God's saying he's going to judge the world for this universal depravity, 
makes for the judgment to be a universal judgment, not a local judgment. It says in Genesis 6 that God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So this depravity, which is used for of many reformed people to speak about the depravity of all men comprehensively, um, is the reason that God judges the earth. There is a universal depravity which describes every man not redeemed that is the cause of this judgment. Okay, so look at Genesis 6, 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved them in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So God is grieving over the comprehensive total depravity of every man. And he's saying, I'm going to judge mankind because mankind in full is depraved. This is not God judging a local group of people for their local depravity. These statements of depravity are universal statements. And there's an exception, though. There is an exception. Who is the exception of this universal definitive statement of depravity? It's in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This depraved, comprehensive statement of evil that is provoking God to then judge all those who are described by this evil, there is an exception. It's Noah. It's not the pagans that were not in this area. It's not the pagans that were, you know, uh, wherever else. The exception of this depravity that is bringing a destruction on that depravity is one man and his family. The universal depravity which precedes this judgment and the exception being not people that are not in this locality, but the exception being a man being elect by grace tells us that this judgment is universal. And it's interesting, even in 820, there is still this universality of depravity, which is in mind when speaking about these events. And it says in verse 20 of eight, chapter 820, and Noah build, builded an altar unto the Lord and took, I'm reading from the King James, sounds funny. I like King James. Uh, every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So basically, this is a comprehensive, global, no exception, every image bearer until, until you get regenerate statement about depravity. The depravity that is being judged in chapter six is global. Every man except for the elect man and his elect family. And the depravity that is still in mind with an away covenant after the flood is also global. Therefore, a localized understanding of these events when the judgment is addressing a globalized depravity is utterly insane. Insane. Yes, I I will say it like that. You know, uh, Orland's very careful. Yeah, I'm not trying to make you feel stupid, even though I'm calling you like anti-intellectual and simplistic the whole time. I I will just say it for what it is. It it is insane uh, to come to that conclusion uh, on the basis of uh, the textual evidence. And by the way, another thing why you cannot see this as a local flood is that the civil element, the judicial civil sword element that is brought in to uh, the Noahic covenant, right, um, must be universal. It must be. It says in... uh, in uh, Genesis 9, but the flesh, uh, and surely your blood of your lives I will require at the hand of every beast, I will require it at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. Okay? So, there is, to deal with the mass violence against the covenant community 
uh, that is before the flood. To deal with this, there is a sword. Man is man everywhere, wherever he's born, is wicked from his youth. And God doing what he did with Cain and not bringing a, a judicial sword of justice to kill Cain, but rather marked him so that he would not be avenged, it didn't work very well. God's graciousness did not work very well for that generation. So in light of the depravity of man and God not wanting to see the church in the state that she was again and seeing man's depravity unravel again, God, in light of man's universal depravity, then institutes a judicial sword. This is Romans 13, the, the, the avenger of God and the sword in order to judge and restrain depravity and the covenant community to be able to perpetuate its mission um, unto the end. So if this is some local sword and about some local flood and some local issue, then the reality of sword bearing, the reality of civil punishment that addresses a globally depraved issue is not being addressed or connected to the event. See, the problem with seeing this as simply a local issue is the universality of the sword being prescribed here in the administration of God's redemptive dealings um, would be negated. So Romans 13, which speaks about every single nation, every single people, because of depravity, there needs to be a sword to restrain depravity, is lost with this localized event and localized solutions to this localized event. No, this is a universal solution to universal depravity, and we see that through the institution of the sword. Another reason why I believe that this absolutely, absolutely has to be uh, a global event, not a local event, is that the, there is excessive language of global extensiveness um, in the whole conversation. So one of the things that, that Orton does, he says, oh, yeah, well, you know, over the whole earth, you know, over the face of the earth, you know, th that, that can be used in different ways in the Bible. And I agree. But the problem with that statement is that there is a multiplicity of different phrases speaking about different elements of the narrative that speak of every and all and everything. It's not just one, okay? It's, it is repetitively, uh, re repetitively in many ways, an extensiveness of every and all and global language. So, for example, it says in, in 6 eight, and, it and it repents of the Lord that he made the man on the earth and it grieved them in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth. I will destroy mankind from the face of the earth. Again, broad global language. 6.11, the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh that corrupt its way upon the earth. Again, another way of saying something is extensive and broad and not local in particular. 6.14 uh, or 6.13, Behold, I do bring a flood of us upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Anything that's alive. Not everything that's alive in this little piece of land. Not anything that's alive in this locality. Everything that's alive, that's breathing. From under heaven. Read the text again. More. And everything that is in the earth shall die. Now, I'm just reading a few verses. And you see that the every and all goes, it is said in so many different ways. To get it in your mind that it's everywhere and everyone. Now, I'm not saying that everyone had spread to the face of every single extremity of the earth. But, but let it be known that the whole earth was drowned and every person on the earth was destroyed by the language. Where people were is irrelevant. The fact that every living, breathing thing is judged and the whole earth is imploded by water is very clear. All right, seven four. For the seven days, I will cause it to rain upon the earth for 40 days and four nights, and every living substance that I have made. 
Notice something. In the Hebrew, they're using different words to say the same events being comprehensive, global, and everywhere. Different words, different phrases. I will destroy from the face of the earth. 7-Eleven. The same day were all the fountains of the deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Verse 14. And every beast after his kind. Okay. And creeping thing upon the earth after his kind. And they went up in Noah into the ark and two of all flesh, where is in the breath of life. And they went in male and female. Verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and met all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Now, remember what Genesis 1 1 says In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. What is the heaven and the earth? Well, you know, there's, there's the things, there is the, uh, the things above the earth and there's the layers of, 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 of the heavens. Um, now, some people say, well, the heavens and the earth speaks about like the invisible realm. The, I mean, either way, the 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 things above that we look at in front of us, you know, are, are considered heavens. Either way, whether you see, whether you think it means heavens as the invisible realm that's created uh, or not, the reality is it, it does include the heavens that are created as well that you see, right? Not just the invisible things. So listen to something. In the beginning, God made heaven and earth. Okay, and then. In Genesis 6, 19, or uh, in 7, 19, it says, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven. So the heavens that were made and the earth, everything under the heavens, okay? Everything that's under those heavens that when God made the whole heavens becomes under water, okay? 7, 21, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth. And of every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and all that was in the dry land died. Again, repetitive, different phrases speaking about totality, not partial, partiality. Verse 23, and every living substance was destroyed, which is upon the face of the ground. And Noah only remained alive. All died except who? Noah. Not all died except Noah and then everybody else, everybody else who was not in this local place. That's, that's the assumption, right? There's other people that were not judged. There's other groups that were not killed. It was just this local judgment. No, every living thing, everything that has breath, was destroyed under the heavens, and only Noah remained alive. And then even the promises in 9.8 are about all living creatures. 9.12, the, the, the rainbow is a covenant between me and the earth. By the way, let me ask you a question. Where do you see the rainbow? Do you see the rainbow only in uh, the Middle Eastern Palestinian area? You see the rainbow everywhere in the whole globe. Why do you see the bow in the cloud everywhere in all the earth where there is people and land? Because the destruction was made that destroyed the whole earth and ended every living thing. And then the covenant that God makes with his people involving the whole earth will be affecting all life and all the earth. Hence, why everyone everywhere sees a sign of that promise that is not localized, but actually globalized. Because I will remember my covenant, which is between me and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no longer become a flood to destroy all flesh. The destruction was of every living creature, and the promise to restrain judgment for the sake of God's people, which will include all other life, is for every living creature. Okay. Moving on um, to why I believe this is absolutely uh, a not local flood, but a global flood, is the judgment parousia theme. 
makes this utterly universal. So notice something. Uh, this conversation about Noah, it doesn't stop. It doesn't end with uh, Genesis 6, 7, and 8, and 9. This conversation is picked up in other places in Scripture. And when it's picked up in other places in Scripture, the universality and globalness of it is being echoed and stated. It says in uh, 2 Peter 3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they will in their ignorance. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are being kept in store, revert, we reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So one thing that is said here uh, by... So, uh, Orland answers the objection. It says, well, this is not speaking about the destruction of the earth. Okay? This is not speaking about the destruction of the earth. It's speaking about the destruction of, of evil and, and the perishing of evil and, and this evil age. That answer doesn't, doesn't get you out of the issue. It says there's a judgment coming on the ungodly. So what it looks like when God comes back, we know for sure there will be a judgment on all the ungodly. When Christ comes back, unless you're some kind of like hardcore preterist where everything in the New Testament already happened, um, this day of the Lord that we're waiting for, remember it says in, in 3.8, uh, that the day of the Lord is it like a thousand years. Uh, this day of the Lord that is coming back is a day where God will judge the earth, the ungodly of the earth. And we know when Christ comes back, it's not to initiate some thousand-year millennial purgatory. We know when he comes back, it's to judge the, the ungodly and to vindicate and glorify the redeemed and recreate uh, the earth into its final phase. So Peter is saying, listen, in, in the same way that every single person that was ungodly, not in covenant with God, was destroyed in the days of Noah, when Christ comes back, there is fire reserved to destroy them and their system and themselves particularly. Now, how on earth does the return of Christ judging all who don't know him, right? How is that echoed? How is that connected when the original judgment was not a judgment on all men over all the earth, wherever they were on the earth? I'm saying they were in every single spot. But it was just a local judgment of some men. So when Christ comes back, if you're seeing how Peter's making the correlation, he's not going to come back to destroy all the ungodly. He's just going to find some place and wipe out some ungodly and save a few people. This is utter nonsense. Peter is saying that, that, that the, there, there is a judgment of fire that is coming on the ungodly when Christ returns to set all things right. All the ungodly will be judged, and those who are in the ultimate ark will be preserved. Why is, and this is likened and comparable to what, Peter? To the days of Noah. When all the ungodly were destroyed by water, and that world perished, and the elect were kept on the earth. See, when Christ comes back, they will be purged from the earth, and we will remain as in the days of Noah. And this earth will be ours to enjoy. The judgment that this is compared to is universal, making a necessity of the universality of judgment in Genesis to be anticipatory of the universality of judgment in the future when Christ returns. This is why it says in first, second Peter 3, 9, uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, 
not when the end should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and all its works thereof shall be burned up. Doesn't matter how you interpret that. Doesn't matter if you if if, if it's if it's you know what's going to happen to the physical earth. It doesn't matter. What matters is that every single person, every single person, and every single element of this age, not in Christ, will perish and be purged and judged. Not there's going to be some localized coming of Christ when he comes back to purge some things. No, regardless of how you understand it. So another reason why I believe that uh, it's impossible to come to a localized flood is that the typological redemptive um, element of uh, the uh, Genesis 6 to 9 also um, is universal. Okay, so Genesis 8, 20, Noah builds an altar unto the Lord, right? So, And, and God smells this aroma, and he says, I will no longer come in this kind of judgment by virtue of, of this sacrifice on this mountain, right? Uh, this and this is very. This is see. We see this uh, with Moses on the mountain interceding, right? The idea is that there is a priestly figure, right? There is a priestly figure who offers a sacrifice, a redemptive pointing sacrifice, a redemptively anticipatory sacrifice. That will lead to redemption of God's people, and will also, in, in, in God being gracious to His people through sacrifice, He will extend a common grace to all others for the sake of His elect people who are right with Him through sacrifice. So this Noah story and this typological, uh, these typological actions of this priestly like propitiatory sacrifice for sins. It is global. Noah is being presented as somebody who appeases the wrath of God for all who are in covenant with Yahweh. Noah is not somebody who's building this local ark for this local group of people. The Noahic covenant is not with the particularities of Israel yet. See, what's important, the Noahic covenant always has the Abrahamic ultimacy in mind. Noah is being presented as a type of Christ in Genesis 8.20. And unless you want to localize the work of Christ, unless you want to tribalize the work of Christ, you cannot tribalize and localize the events of Noah. This is about a comprehensive judgment, right? That is then followed by a globalized opportunity for covenantal mercy. By this anticipatory typological figure, Noah is being presented as somebody who represents what it means to be in covenant with God through a priestly figure offering a propitiatory sacrifice for not just a locality, but for everyone, everyone whosoever would believe. And this is why Peter says this in 1 Peter 3 18. For Christ has also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein a few that is eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. So picture this. Peter is speaking about our baptism with the analogical and with with I wouldn't say analogical with with the typological language of the flood event the ark and the flood event and noah he's saying listen in the, in the same way that waters points 
to you not being saved by the magical, you know, the magical uh, hocus pocus of water, but through the faith that you, the, the faith that lays hold of the promises in the water, he's saying that you avert the judgment of God upon all the earth as you identify with the greater Noah who went through the judgment event for you. And you pass through the judgment of God. You have passed from the wrath of God to the world to come. You've averted the judgment of God over all men because you've identified with the Lord in baptism, the pledge of faith, of a good conscience. So basically what Peter is saying is that, listen, the Noah event speaks about how everybody who is not in union with God's covenantal means was destroyed. But you have averted a greater and final and fuller judgment through identifying with, not with Noah on the ark, but with the ultimate instrument, the ultimate means of redemption, namely in union with Christ, right? Being buried with him in baptism, right? Co-crucified with him. Peter's saying that there is a judgment upon all men. All men are in judgment. And the only way to safety is in the reality that of what your baptism points to, namely salvation in Christ. Peter is saying that the only way for sinners to survive the judgment of God is in a way comparable and analytical and, and comparable and parallel to the events of Noah. But if this is just about some local people getting locally judged, how on earth would this correspond to Christian baptism? Does it make sense? Is Jesus, are those who are baptized, are we saying that we are saved from simply a local problem of local events and local judgments? Or are we saying that there, we, are, we are saved from the global judgment over all men by which the only solution is union with Christ through faith? See, our baptism that corresponds to the days of Noah and the events of Noah is speaking about the universality of guilt and judgment, the universality of the wrath of God over all that is remedied only by identifying with the ultimate Noah in union with him, which is signified and sealed in our baptism. Peter is speaking about the Noah event in a way that represents the global issue that sinners have with the unique soul solution in Christ. Now, if, if you localize the events, then the universal elements of sin and redemption in Peter are nonsensical. Furthermore, uh, the way Noah is spoken about is, is, is as one who is bringing a universal solution to a universal issue. Not some kind of local hero to some local folks. Genesis 5.28, it says, And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son and called his name Noah, saying, This one shall comfort us concerning the work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. So Noah is prophesied by his father as being someone who is Adamic-like typologically Adamic-like, who will bring some relief from the toil and curse of the whole ground because Adam, when Adam sinned, there was a curse and a toil brought upon the whole universe. And this Noah is somebody who is representative and anticipatory and moving the conversation along to reversal of that. The whole, the whole, the whole Christ-centered meaning of this demands for it to be a universal judgment of sin and sinners, and a particular redemption of those who are redeemed by grace. This is a global issue that Noah is representing in the way he's prophetically spoken about, both before he's come into the picture. And the events happen, and also after in the New Testament. 
This is why Genesis 8 4 it says the ark rested in the seventh month. This universal Sabbath rest that is lost in the first Adam, God is bringing us into a redemptive Sabbath in a typological sense in the story of Noah. See, the Sabbath was universal. The fall and restlessness and toil and curse was universal. And the language of the events of Noah have a universality to them throughout. And furthermore, one of the things that that is said is like, well, we have to understand, you know, Genesis 6 to 9 in light of 10 and 11. So 10 has this list of nations that wouldn't summarize every single nation that's ever existed. And so therefore, since the list of nations in Genesis 10 is not every single people group that has ever existed, therefore, the judgment spoken of in Genesis 9 to 6, 6 to 9, cannot be universal. Let me just say this. The whole world that that existed died. The whole world that existed died. That, that's facts. Everyone. But that's, does that mean that every single people group that has ever existed, already existed by the time of the flood? No. Let me tell you something. People groups form up often. So what about the Australians? Was there Australians before Noah and the events of flood? You don't know that. You don't know that. <laughs> okay. So the Genesis 10 is speaking about the whole world that was. It wasn't just speaking about some people. That was the whole world. Listen, Israel in the book of Genesis is being told that their story needs to be understood in light of the whole globe. Okay. Genesis 11 is saying that God judged the whole world. See, let us make man in our image and creation. God makes this whole world to image him. And this whole world turns against him and God judges the whole world. And then shortly after, the whole world gathers together. Instead of scattering, part of the reason why there wasn't people groups all over the globe is because man has been rebellious and they refuse to scatter from the very beginning. You know, the first city is Cain wanting to make a name for himself. Uh, and, you know, uh, triumph and, and humanism instead of spreading out uh, and imaging God throughout the earth. So man collectively rebels against God. And Babel is speaking about how the whole world is confused by competing tribalistic peoples and different languages to preserve the whole world from what God promised. God promised, I'm not going to show the whole world. So here's what I'm going to do. Instead of allowing the whole world to unify in depravity, unrestrained, unmitigated, I'm going to judge the whole world, as we see in Babel, so that the whole world would be restrained. And their competing interests in the tribalistic groups would be a hindrance to all-out uh, rebellion. Babel is explaining why every nation has these differences. There is nothing local, local about Genesis 11. There's nothing local about Genesis 6 to 9. I would say nothing exclusively local. And there's nothing local about Genesis 1 to 5. This is the story of the world. And by the way, Pentecost is described in ways that reverses Babel. Babel is a universal rebellion that is followed by a universal judgment and recreation, right? Preceded by that. And Pentecost speaks about this global event in Babel is reversed in Pentecost and the Spirit coming down. The story of redemption going from Babel all the way to Pentecost is universal. Ba th these men made a case for why, uh, why Genesis 6 to 9 is not universal because they believe that the Babel event was not about all nations being judged at Babel. But here's the thing. The whole globe and its issues is being explained to Israel. And the whole world's issues that are being unpacked and layered in these, in these chapters is then going to be reversed 
in the new covenant ministry. Genesis 12, 1, about Abraham being a blessing to all the nations is because all the nations in chapter 11 were in rebellion against God. So God takes one man out of his nation to be the means that all these nations in rebellion against God would become in covenant with Yahweh. So there is a global judgment. There is a particular redemption that is anticipating anticipating a universality of redemption through that particularity. Sound, sim sound similar? Yes. There is a global rebellion in Genesis chapter 6 that is followed by a particular redemption. And that particular redemption in the midst of that universal rebellion and judgment will then be followed by God coming back and redeeming the nations comprehensively through that particular grace showed to that particular person in the midst of universal judgment. So the, if you want to tribalize and localize the Noah event, then you have to tribalize and localize the Babel event. And then you have to tribalize and localize the Abrahamic promises. And basically, Christianity is just one of many things that is redemptive. But the universal issue in Genesis 6 and the particular redemption is then going to a universal solution. The universal issue in chapter 11 and the particular solution of grace is then going to a universal solution. Universal issue, particular redemption, unto the universal redemption of the nations. But localizing this localizes the gospel, localizes sin, localizes creation, localizes judgment. So many, oh, what's the problem with this thinking? It's not heretical? Absolutely, this leads you to working it out in its fullness to unbiblical, heretical conclusions, like a localized view of judgment, a localized view of redemption, a localized view of sin, that's what it leads to. You're saying, well, I'm not going there with that. See, that's where your logic of this text goes, because the scriptures speak about global judgment and global sin. The scriptures speak about global, universal, new covenant, all nations redemption, using the language of Genesis 6 to 9 and 12 and 10 and 11. This is deeply problematic. See, I didn't choose to speak about universal depravity and God's all-encompassing eschatological judgment and the redemption of the cosmos comprehensively in Christ. I didn't use, I didn't choose to write and use Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 to make a case for those things. But God did. So to particularize things that God uses to be analogically and parallel to universal redemptive things, universal creational things, universal sin issues, is deeply, deeply error in, in error and flawed and heretical. Now, to be fair to... Uh, this person. Well, I don't, I, I'm not denying a universal judgment. I'm not denying. I'm not denying universal depravity. I'm not denying there's a universal covenant of grace for the elect and all the nations. A very try. I'm not denying that. But if you were to work out consistently your claims of this localized event, which is used to make a case for globalized issues and solutions, then you would be. So it's not enough for you to say, I'm not denying orthodoxy, but an unorthodox understanding of things like this, which are used to convey key essential elements of orthodoxy. Um, there is some, <laughs> let me tell you something. Where this goes is to all that heresy. Because the connections that these universal events have to essential doctrines about universal issues and solutions. So, yeah, this is connected to essential things. Is creation a localized thing? Well, your interpretation of the fall makes it a localized thing. Is depravity a localized thing? Is justice a localized thing? Is the sword that, that restrains depravity simply for that group of people in that little area that were flooded? Or is, is justice and the sword a universal necessity? Is judgment universal, right? 
Did God just judge some sinners on the earth in his holiness? Or did God judge all sinners on all the earth and destroy them all except for those who hid in Christ? Your view of God's holiness is affected by this. Your view of God's judgment and justice is affected by this. Your view of the future when Christ comes back and what you expect to happen to the ungodly is affected by this. The universality of redemption is affected by this particular localized view of the redemption story in Noah. See, one of the things that covenant theology does is it gives you a continuous clarity from creation to new creation by this story of recapitulation. God is telling one story from creation to new creation, and it recapitulates. And as, as it recapitulates and retells itself, certain elements of the same story are added. But with this kind of interpretation, it has this radical discontinuity with the story of God. It unhinges the Noah story from the gospel story, though he's claiming to want to preserve the gospel by this. See, it, the, the connection between Noah's uh, events and the, and the gospel means that a particular localized view of gospel and the typological figure of Noah will lead to a, inevitably, should lead to, if you're consistent, to a, <laughs> a localized tribalistic gospel. Your view of creation is, is attached to this. Is creation a universal thing or a local thing? Well, according to Noah and his connection to creation, these are global things. Right? How holy is God? God is so holy that he literally killed everybody except eight people. He killed everybody except eight people. That's how holy God is. Oh, God just killed a, an area of some problematic folks, but not the whole known world of people. Your view of God's holiness and your need for Christ is diminished by this. Okay? The word of God, I believe, is diminished and undermined as well. No matter how many times in the video he says, um, you know, I'm just trying to be faithful to the text. By the way, bro, most of most of his arguments, just listen to both videos I, I, I show you. Most of his arguments are not textual. The, the big one was the big textual argument that came up was the, the language of all the earth and how this is used um, differently to not speak about the whole entire globe. That was a main textual argument. The rest of it was like, how could that happen? That doesn't make sense. How do the animals go from here? How do penguins go here? And how, and how do how do ape, you know, like most of the arguments were rational, logical, and there was a very minimalistic textual argument. I, I believe the word of God is undermined by this. Uh, because it's precipitate. Well, here's the thing. like his, his first video starts. His first video starts by showing a bunch of God-hating pagans with a just immoral TV show laughing laughing at the idea of a global flood and its implications. So this is the video that starts his video. You know what I thought when I read that? It reminds me of all the people laughing at Noah at the idea that God was going to destroy the whole world. So instead of saying we should be like Noah, a preacher of righteousness, preach judgment, right? In the midst of a per crooked and perverse generation, that was having parties and marrying until the day that the, the, the flood came. So in, instead of seeing that, that laughter about the flood uh, as an opportunity for us to stand our ground about the scandal of its implications, we're supposed to listen to that laughter and then change the story so they're not laughing at the story. <laughs> the irony of this is, is, is astounding. The original Noah event is, is, met, is, is, is met by this mockery and disdain. And people are still mocking and disdaining that. And we're going to win. We're going to win the world by allowing their laughter to be subsided by reducing the complexity of, of the narrative to be conducive to your godless mocking. No. No. And so let me just unpack a few um, of his uh, he, so he responded to some objections 
uh, and he said a few things. And so here, here's some my, my responses, some of his responses. Um, so he says, here's some fallacies that I, I believe that you can, you can see in this logic. So all the earth can mean not literally the whole globe. He shows in many places in Bible that all the earth could speak about um, a local area. Okay. So therefore, um, the Noah event um, is speaking about a local event. Just because a phrase could mean something doesn't mean that it does mean something. Just because the whole world could mean everyone, like the whole world died in Adam, that means everyone. It doesn't mean that it always means that, right? So John 3, for God to love the whole world, that's not saying the whole world in the same way that Paul says the whole world died in Adam. Right? John 3 is whole world. It, so the idea like, okay, this phrase has been used uh, in this way over here. Therefore, this is how it's being used over here. That's not necessarily the case. Now, hopefully, as you remember me walking to the text, it becomes really clear that just because all the earth can be used locally, it doesn't mean that that has any bearing um, in, in Genesis 6 to 9, number one. Um, number two, one thing that, that he said many times, um, just because somebody believes something, so he's looking he, he, he's looking through church history, and he could find some people that believe a, a, a local flood. Just because someone believes something doesn't mean that it's legitimate or normative or acceptable. Okay? Tertullian, a famous church father, was believed in charismatic, weird prophecy things and women preachers with Montanism. Just because Ma Tertullian had these beliefs um, and he was known in many ways as an Orthodox Trinitarian theologian, that doesn't make it normative or legitimate. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a very fallible argument. Just because Baptists can point to, you know, some credo baptisms in the early church, that doesn't mean that that's a acceptable, legitimate position of the early church. Just because there were some weirdos in the early church that were premillennial doesn't mean that that was an acceptable, normal view. This is the, oh, look, I can find some people in church history that had this view. Oh, it's okay. No, that's, that, that's, that's not the case. Even if a good person holds the view. So he said, oh, I, could, I found a few people uh, that believe this. And actually, they were solid. That, that, that doesn't make your case solid. What I, what I see desperate is like, look, I, I don't want to be seen as a progressive player of God's word person. And here's a reason why I'm not. Well, I can find it in church history. That doesn't get you out of it. Well, I know a good guy who said this. That doesn't get you out of it either. I mean, you could find great theologians who had bad views about slavery. What's your point? That doesn't vindicate uh, the beliefs of slavery that they had just because a guy who was very solid was off on that. Just because John Stott wrote a lot, a lot of good books doesn't vindicate his, his belief um, that uh, in annihilation. So if, if you were to say, oh, look, I found this guy who, was, who's, who had a lot of solid things. Um, and, you know, he believes in annihilation too. When we die, we just disappear if we're unbelievers and we go into, we, we kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, so, you know, it's okay. No. You finding an, a solid guy to agree with a position doesn't make it okay or normal or legitimate. Okay. Furthermore, um, citing four or five or even 20 names is far from making this normative. Let me tell you, without even blinking or even, this is not debatable. The normal position of most Christians for thousands of years has been a global flood. That has been the normal position. Okay? So, uh, Ortland, you know, citing four or five or six names does nothing to prove that this is a, is a legitimate exegetical Christian perspective of the Noah story. The mass amounts of normalcy to this 
is that you can even show me a <laughs> show me 500 guys who believe in local foot. You're still out now outnumbered by millions and millions of Christians who believed the contrary. One of the things that 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 Orland says is, well, you know, in the 19th century, this became the normal view. How many pastors out of all the thousands of pastors confessed a local view of the flood? I would, I would just this is very likely the case. There were multiple occurrences of this view showing up in the 19th century. More than before. It started getting some traction. But someone saying that there it was a normal view in the 19th century. Based on what? Show me. Show me the data. Show me the data of how many ministers of the gospel in America believed in some whack local flood perspective. Not, oh, I... I we saw some people, you know, even now, there's plenty of people that are having views about sexuality in the church that no one has had. So what? That's not representative of the whole church. That's even representative of, 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 of half of the church or even a third of the church. Just because it's, it's, it's something that is, you know, more prevalent and can be heard. Um, and quoting Meredith Klein doesn't help you either. Oh, I know Meredith Klein, you know. Yeah, Meredith Klein had a lot of weird views of a lot of things. He had a weird view of God of the covenant of grace. He had a weird view of the, about the Holy Spirit. He believed the Holy Spirit incarnated something before uh, in, in creation, the indoxation of the Spirit. He had a real weird view of, of the canon of Scripture. The New Testament canon is the only canon for the New Testament church, not the Old Testament. He had a weird view of the law of God, the Sabbath. You want to cite a, a, a guy that has a lot of strange confessional views that was controversial as you're again oh this guy has his view and he was no pc uh, and i'm good but that that that's not an argument it's not an argument uh and even one thing he says that's interesting too he says well you know a lot of the arguments that people are making now about the flood are not arguments that 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 global flood christians made before like the the earth being reshaped do you know why people were not making those kind of arguments before? Because this was not a thing. Just because some guy says this is a debate doesn't mean it's a debate. So you found a guy and said, he said, oh yeah, Christians debate this stuff. That doesn't mean it's a debate. I'll tell you something. There's people in the PCA that think uh, <laughs> women in ministry, it's a real debate. It's not. It's not a real debate, bro. Some people think it's a real debate. It's not. It's the, the case has been closed. It's one and done and obvious. But you know, that guy says it's a debate. So what? So what? And the reason why it's people are saying things about a global flood, like the reshaping of the earth is why blah, blah, blah. You explain certain things is because now, now more commonly, uh, that position is being challenged. So as, as it's challenged in ways that it wasn't, in some broader sense, I would say the challenge is becoming more and more now than ever, right? Um, because we're so advanced now, we know so much now. And by the way, you know, Orland talking about science all the time. Science is no longer science in the West. Science is superstitious, superstitious witchcraft, bro. They don't even know what a woman is. They don't know what a man is. They don't know what basic things are, and it's called science. You know, um, but but anyway, science is becoming much more predominant, um, even though it's becoming hocus pocus, brouhaha, strange, right? The things that science is is uh, claiming to be scientific. So yeah, people are are making these claims more, and so now Christians have developed their arguments more. So people weren't saying certain things about same sex attraction in the church way back when. They weren't making the arguments that we're making now. They weren't making arguments about women in ministry before as they are now why because it wasn't a conversation so so new new elements of the conversation being added is not disproving the view it's just saying that now the local flood view is getting some traction and so people are just expounding more about it another thing that, that he says that to, to give credence to his view is uh i can find this person who has a different view of the age of the earth uh 
different view of the age of the earth and also a different view of the days. You know, like, it's like Augustine has a different view of the days and this person has a different view of, of the age of the earth. Okay. That doesn't justify your position either. Number one, saying that I think the days could be interpreted in different ways, like a framework theory. Saying that I think the earth could be older than 6,000 years. It's not as egregious and problematic and dismissive of the clear text as a, as a uh, local flood. <laughs> okay. Um, Augustine didn't make a case for a local flood, though he had a different view of days. Uh, and it even other people have cited. So it doesn't help you to say that I know people and that differ about the age of the earth. Or I, people used Christians used to differ about like is is the you know is our solar system centered around the sun or earth? Oh, they thought it was the earth. That 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 interpretation has no theological bearing on any major doctrine. Who cares, bro? Oh, I know people that thought the 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 universe revolved around the earth. Our universe, our so whatever. That interpretation bears bears what on what? Nothing. But the Noah story has a connection to soteriology, to creation, to depravity, to the work of Christ, to the judgment of God and the return of Christ. You saying that, well, these people think this, this about days and this person just think, think this about like, uh, you know, uh, the, the sun and the earth and what that has no a lot of that. A lot of that has no bearing on, on me. This is way more serious. That doesn't redeem you either. OK. Um, and I would say just because things in the text uh, seem unnatural or strange, um, it, it doesn't mean that it is unnatural. And I'm, let me tell you something: if you take uh, the logic, if you take the logic, most of his arguments was, wow, you know, like all those animals on a boat. How do you care for them? How do they, how, you know? How do they survive? And you know, how do they get on? And, and how do they get off and populate the whole earth? And like, like all that stuff, if that's hard for you, bro, and that is the the way you process difficulty in the text, bro, you're gonna un, you're gonna you're gonna rationalize excess endless things out of the Bible. You are. You are. I mean, because the Bible is full of things that are hard to believe, like the Red Sea. People have a hard, hard issue with the Red Sea and what happened to the Egyptian Empire, right? Uh, it, it, you know, Israel surviving, you know, millions of people in the desert. You know, the stories of, of Jericho, you know, Jonah. Uh, there, there are, you know, the, the battles where the sun stood still. I mean, even like the, the resurrection of Jesus, like this idea that because something is hard to conceive of, therefore there has to be some alt. This is what the liberals did to destroy everything in the Bible that was strange. Now, to be fair to, 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 to Gavin, he says, well, I believe in a supernatural Bible and I believe in a supernatural God. Amen. You know, and he quotes, I think, B.B. Warfield or something about it. You can say amen, but here's the thing. You're beginning to approach things in the text at face value as not legitimately conceivable because of the difficulty of how you would conceive that working. You know? Like what would it look like for an, the entire world to build one tower, you know, into the sky? And the second you go on that route, you, you're going to save Christianity by trying to rationalize things that people laugh at and are strange. Um, well, good luck with that, because the whole Bible is full of things that are very difficult to come to grips with. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth pretty makes, much makes it simple. Uh, 
I mean, if God can uh, keep one man alive in some fish for three days, then I think he could, uh, you know, figure it out with a bunch of animals on some big boat um, for 40 days. Anyways, so here's a, a, a few closing, th closing thoughts about um, this. Uh, this uh, this idea that we that um we're going to we're going to win people to the gospel by reinterpreting things in scripture that Christ, that non Christians think is silly is is just a church growth seeker friendly non-Holy Spirit depending way of seeing um, the work of the church. The way that that Noah uh, dealt with the mockery of the culture was not by accommodating the ark of God and the plans of God to something more conducive to what would be acceptable. The way the way he responded to a laughing culture it says in uh, Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah being warned of the God and the things seen of yet moved with fear, prepared the ark, to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. That's not the way he processed it. Paul did not uh, defend the scandal and silliness of the gospel by then restating elements of the gospel in, in terms of in ways that were conducive to the mockery of the culture. He says, well, the, the gospel and many of the things about the gospel is folly to man. And in its folly, their God manifests his wisdom and power. Because the natural man can understand the things of God, period. Because he understands them naturally. So, so Paul did not say, you know, you, you, I, I really need to give you some naturalistic, uh, accommodated, humanistic rational view of this so you can kind of absorb it says you need the holy spirit let's just be real you need the holy spirit to understand uh, everything in scripture noah's story genesis story creation story um it, things are understood by by the scriptures um in, in in the power of the spirit not 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 by not by making this more believable by people who hate God and are are suppressing the truth and unrighteous. And you know, one of the things it's funny because uh Orland says, Well, you know, I'm not trying to be secret friendly, I'm not trying to cater the culture. Well, why did you start the video with a bunch of pagans laughing at the Noah story and saying and, and assuming that this is the issue? Like if this is our view, then then, then non-Christians are gonna think we're foolish because we believe these foolish things what 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 started the whole conversation is a bunch of people who hate christ laughing about what the bible says about a global flood i believe that uh this view of the noah story and also the other things uh that are being said uh by orland is actually confusing the sheep you're appealing to skeptics and the culture and you're confusing the sheep and you're you're condescendingly making fun of them for being not as cultured and intellectual as you they haven't read they haven't read as much books as you you know what they didn't need to read all your books and all your your your, your fancy scholars with all of their highfalutin uh speculations about the text um they just they have bibles you know they have regular pastors that unpack the word of god um and um yeah this is this is confusing um, to regular sheep. Um, yeah. I would say something else about the situation. Uh, something interesting. I was looking into this uh, before, and it says about uh, Gavin Orland. So it, it says uh, here in this article, Gavin Orland leaving California church to be a full-time theology YouTuber in Nashville. Uh, why, why is that important for me to bring out? Well, I feel like one of the issues with people that are in these kinds of ministries, right? Basically, like I'm just constantly uh, trying to 
soften something biblical is controversial to appeal to like the unbelieving world. Um, a lot of them are very disconnected from real Christians, real everyday normal Christians. They're primarily connected to uh, the uh, the elite world, the media world, and also like the uh, the Christian the, the the kind of Christian that has really sold their soul uh, to progressivism and and the and the thinking of this age. And so when I'm reading, when I'm listening to this man's content, and I see that he left a local church to be a full time YouTuber, it just shows me. Um, a, a somewhat systemic issue in the church. It's, we just have a bunch of people that are actually pastoring churches and also not pastoring churches, but they're, they're in these like kind of like nonprofit uh, parachurch things. They're, they're very disconnected from the regular person and the regular Christian. Let me tell you this. The regular Christian does not care about uh, your, your whole... The regular Christian does not care. The regular average Christian America does not care about a local flood. That's not their concern. You know what they're, you know what they're struggling with? They're, they're struggling with their, their Christianity being assaulted around every corner by, by people who hate Christ. And you're sitting over here, you know, trying to make the people that hate Christ, the people that hate Christ understand our scriptures in a way that is more logical to their carnality. Um, I just, you're just really disconnected. People like this feel, in my opinion, are really disconnected from the real Christian world. And they're trying to impress pagans and elite, elite regime, elite kind of a compromised Christians than actually speaking to the regular, you know, local pastor, YouTube, theologian and therefore you get it and you, you speak about all these things in ways that i feel like is, is very disconnected from uh the local church that's just that's my perspective uh so you know he's getting i think i think you guys are really disconnected from the literature out there maybe they are but they're not disconnected from the bible but you appear to be very disconnected uh from the a a everyday average christian you over here, you know, concerned about what, you know, this, you know, uh, show, this anti-God mocking Christian show is saying about Christians. Um, another thing that I would say wrapping up is uh, you have to consider people and what they're saying in light of their overall circle. So. You know, he, he's in this church. Uh, I mean, you say the church, so I, I don't say it wrong. Emmanuel, it's his church. He's at this church now. I, don't, I believe he's not on staff, but this is where he went. The article says he went over here to be a part of the church. He's not officially paid there or on staff. But, but you know, this is this is his father's church that, that he led for a long time. Uh, and look at the people that are at this church. Just to give you, uh, I'm, I'm going to explain myself. So Sam Alberry. Is an associate pastor in this church. Russell Moore is a minister in residence. Okay, so 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 why 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 is that significant? If you are known, Gavin, for having like this non-traditional view of creation, of the creation days, and and of the creation story, and and you're also Known for having this more, more like affected by cultural, modern culture and science and modern exegetes view of the flood. Um, and you're at a church, you know, uh, with uh, Sam Elberry, Outberry, who's basically trying to uh, accommodate biblical sexual ethics to the culture. Go read his book, That God Does Not Hate Gays. Read it. it. It is accommodating the biblical ethic, the clarity of the law of God when it comes to sexuality. It's, 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 I say accommodating. I'm not saying it's capitulating entirely, right? This is the issue with the side B SSA crowds is they want some in-between between the ethics of Scripture and the LGBT rainbow right. They want some middle ground. So you have a another guy who spends much of his time uh, 
softening gayness and, and uh, I believe soft peddling an inappropriate uh, view of the law of God and sanctification, right? And you got another guy, Russell Moore, who's made a living out of mocking the church, slamming the church, promoting wokeness, promoting, you know, state, statism, elitism, right? He's become a mouthpiece for every single thing of the Democratic National Party, right? Uh, he's made a made, made a living out of mocking the church. When this is like the 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 trajectory, when this is the environment, it, it, it's hard to take seriously someone saying, "Well, I'm just trying to show you a legitimate biblical interpretation." When you're doing something that is contra traditional understanding of the church and scripture with other things. You know, and you're surrounded by people that are notorious for these, like, we're just different kinds of Christians who see the Bible differently than most Christians have seen it. When that is your environment, this has seems to be very little to, to pastoring people. It seems to be very little to do with caring for people. It seems to be simply something to grandstand and find and make a name for yourself uh, that is not in light of the ultimate name and the fame of Christ. It's just this, 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 this Christianity, when it's surrounded by everything is some kind of, yeah, we're not like those Christians. Uh, we agree much more with the mainstream thought of the day. When, when that is what you're notorious for, and that is what your, what your regularity is, um, it doesn't seem like you're trying to help the church uh, honor the Lord more. It, it feels like you're, you're selling out the church for the glory and honor and praise of men. Because all these things are making men out there commend you. Yeah, Russell Moore. Yeah, Sam. Yeah, Gavin. Yeah, those, 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 those Christians are ridiculous. God drowned the whole earth. You know, uh, homosexuality as a desire is not a sickness. It's a wicked perversion that the Holy Spirit must mortify. I'm, quote, I'm That's quoting from his book. He compared homosexual attractions and, and, and the sin to being sick. I want to I appeal to you, church. Do not be duped. Uh, by this kind of stuff. Do not be humiliated. Uh, do not be shook by it. Um, it. It is just this. This. Perpetual. Dance. Of accommodation. And syncretism. And, in, and instead of. And, and instead of. Presenting. The church to the world. It just seems that they're presenting the world to the church. This uh, man is saying he's really concerned with the gospel and that people would encounter the gospel. Well, let me just close by saying this thought. A holiness, a holiness, a judgment, a, a holiness and judgment that was so severe that the world that was perished and every single person and every single family, every single, every single animal, all that had the breath of life were destroyed by the holy, holy righteous wrath of God. And that is an anticipation of the day where Christ will return. And the wicked will and godly will perish by fire. But there was a ark where that massive destruction. That massive destruction, which was global, was averted by God's covenantal promises to, to sinners who receive him by faith. That highlights the gospel. Every time a sinner sees rain, and every time a sinner anywhere in the world sees a rainbow, and they say, you know what? The whole earth should be drowned right now. The whole earth was drowned right now. Every human being righteously died under the holy wrath of God. And every day we see rain 
that doesn't destroy. We're reminded that a holy God is patiently, patiently extending his mercy. And that destruction that was global is being restrained but delayed for a much greater permanent judgment. You need the gospel. You need Jesus. You need to be baptized. See, the law of God and the holiness of God and the fierce wrath of God un, unlocalized, <laughs> unminimized leads people to the grace of God. You want to be a gospel-centered Christian? You want to win people to the gospel? Then preach a God who drowns the entire earth in his holiness for their sin. Except for the grace that is in Christ. That, my friends, is how you win the elect to faith. Keyword elect. Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the elect that may inherit salvation. See, what these people are doing in the name of Christianity, in my opinion, is they have a ministry for goats. They're speaking about truth in a way that goats who have not the spirit of God would hear. We don't do ministry for goats. We do ministry for the elect. And therefore, we preach the whole counsel of God in all of his controversy. Yeah, God made them male and female. Yes. We preach the whole counsel of God, the whole law of God, that men would realize their need for the whole gospel of God. So I'm done. Done. Local? No. Global? Yes. It has massive implications. And connections to our view of creation, fall, redemption, and even consummation and the return of Christ. Don't sell, don't buy, <laughs> don't buy this stuff. Don't buy it. Let me tell you something. This stuff is all over the place. It's going to increase and abound, and many will stumble. They are stumbling. But ain't nothing new. Nothing new. And nothing new. Christianity, true Christianity, holistic, comprehensive, cover to cover, whole Bible Christianity is always hard, always resisted, always coming forth with thorns and thistles, though producing some. Anyways, signing off. Kingdom Plugs.